Good morning. This second presentation in today's cat cracking session is on case studies of optimizing and troubleshooting FCC reactors and regenerators. In this presentation, I will be demonstrating a technology that is being used by refiners for making better decisions about FCC reactor and regenerator design and operation. Essentially, this is a decision support system for your FCC turnaround planning process. Today I'm going to be demonstrating the capability of this technology using two case studies. I'd like to start by summarizing some of the typical industry challenges for FCC unit design and operations and then describe what we see as what's lacking, a view inside your fluidized system, whether it's the reactor or the regenerator. I'll demonstrate this by showing two case studies. The first is an afterburn root cause analysis for a commercial FCC regenerator and the second on the reactor side is an erosion evaluation for a commercial FCC reactor cyclone system. I'll summarize by showing some of the ways that Barracuda Virtual Reactor is bringing value across multiple segments of multiple industries and then leave some time for questions and answers. First off, reliability is the number one issue in refining. Uh, this I received from an anonymous oil major executive who said he didn't have approval from his company to state their name, but I think anyone here in this room could agree that this is certainly the case. We all want to maximize yield and performance of these units while minimizing capex and risk, but ultimately the number one challenge is to keep the units up and operating well. We want to maintain or improve on-stream reliability and possibly even extend operating cycles. There was a time when operating cycles were three and four years. Now five years is common, and I think some folks would like to extend that even further. Operators are also desirous of taking advantage of short-term swings in commodity prices. We've talked a lot this morning about the lighter nature of shale oil versus the feedstocks that we've been moving towards, the heavier oils. We're moving now away from the heavier oils back toward the lighter side, and in fact so light that in some cases they bring along challenges of their own. Even for units that are operating well, the business and regulatory environment is constantly changing and putting new pressures on refiners. Units not operating well have a clock ticking and only a limited time to address their issues. Lastly, both new equipment and revamps are expensive and risky. But design and operational decisions are often made without a full understanding of the root causes behind identified problems and effective solutions for addressing them. So what is lacking in this process? In our view, it's a view inside your fluidized system. Don't guess what's going on inside the unit. Take a look inside using a technology like Barracuda Virtual Reactor and look at things such as the fluidization quality and mode, the gas and particle residence time distributions, entrainment rates, mixing profiles, temperature profiles, whether hot or cold spots, solid fluxes, circulation rates, etc., erosion locations and severity, cyclone loadings, product generation rates, oxygen usage, emissions, and also operation at off design point conditions, whether startup, turndown, or upset. So what's the value of having a view inside your FCCU reactor or regenerator? Well, optimal design and operation plus greater reliability is certainly going to lead to higher profits. Having this view inside reduces the risks of any of the changes that you've planned for achieving those optimal design and operating conditions or greater reliability. You can use this technology to help you mitigate erosion to increase life and reliability reduce catalyst carryover, minimize losses and makeup cat requirements, and meet emissions requirements more cost effectively. It also allows you to troubleshoot equipment and minimize downtime when you have models readily available should any issue arise in the plant. The net result is more reliable and profitable FCC units. This first case study is for an FCC regenerator located at a California refinery. It's a fairly large vessel, about 70 feet tall, 50 feet in diameter, with 24 cyclones in 12 pairs, primary and secondary. This is a rather unique regenerator in 
that it has this, uh, what they call a Christmas tree distributor, a multiple arm uh, spent catalyst distributor that distributes the spent cat through the bed. Combustion air and uh, fluidization air is provided by two supplemental air rings. There is a very long spent catalyst riser leading into the unit, uh, but the most important thing about this unit is the driving force that led to this work being done. The reason that this regenerator was to be studied was because of afterburning going on in the regen. This unit has been apt to burning to the tune of about 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit for virtually its entire operating life of about 70 years. Different suggestions have been put forward as to what might be causing the apt burning, but no effective fix has been implemented. So it was needed to create a model for the regenerator, including the spent cat riser, and look at what might be causing this apt burning condition and what could be done to address it. So here is the geometry of both the spent cat riser and regenerator. To model this unit, we divided the unit into three pieces. Model one was the spent cat riser, which was modeled with both thermal and chemistry to determine the boundary conditions that would be uh, put onto the spent cat distributor. So here you're seeing the catalyst coming down from the reactor being swept around the bend by the lift air. And we did study the reactions as well to determine if there was any chemistry going on in the spent cat riser that turned out to be insignificant. There just isn't enough time uh, the particles are swept up the riser so quickly. But here you can see the solids flux that we ultimately fed into model two, which is the model of the regenerator with the hollow distributor arms. So here we're modeling the spent cat being forced through those 17 arms in the distributor, through the nozzles and into the bed. From this, we placed flux planes at all of the exit points, so at each nozzle in the spent cat distributor, and then those solids fluxes were put into the final model, model three, which is the full model of the FCC regenerator with the coke burning kinetics. So here are all the boundary conditions as they've been applied. Now we can see the bed starting up. The withdrawal well you can see over to the right. Now we're looking at particle volume fraction. And you can see that there is very little in the way of particles above the bed because they're colored blue. Dark blue means almost zero uh, particle volume fraction. But there are still some particles floating around in the freeboard, of course, or we wouldn't have the afterburning condition going on. But you can see that the particles are being captured by the cyclones and returned to the bed. Here we're looking at multiple views of thermal and chemistry results at the same time. This can be very helpful in studying the afterburn. On the far left is the fluid temperature, then the mole fraction of oxygen, CO2, SOX, and NOx. Here in the second plot, you can see what was identified later as one of the major causal factors for the afterburn, which is an oxygen-starved region in the middle of the bed. Going along with it are streams of air that are effectively bypassing the bed around the outside. So you have an oxygen depleted condition in the middle of the bed, allowing unregenerated catalyst to be blown into the freeboard where it meets the excess oxygen from the air bypassing the bed. And there's the recipe for the afterburning condition. We did look at erosion values from this uh, study, even though the real purpose of it was for afterburn. There were not any big surprises on the erosion side. It was really done more as a demonstration. So when we go back and look at the results of the three models, on the regenerator entry maldistribution, the spent cat riser flow analysis showed that yes, there is a maldistribution as the catalyst climbs up that slope and uh, climbs up the riser. Uh, however, 
is that maldistribution something that actually matters? Is it amplified by the distributor arms, or is it smeared away by the distributor arms? When we go and look at the actual mass loadings through the spent cat distributor, we can see a remarkably homogeneous loading at each circumferential point. Um, if you go around the circumference, there's really not a lot of variation. Uh, when you move in radially, again, you look at this circle here, 64, 68, 71, quite consistent, and in the middle even more so. Uh, so the conclusion was that the spent cat riser is not contributory. Uh, you can see a very even loading despite whatever maldistrib uh, maldistribution is coming up from the riser. There is a little bit of variance here as a result of the presence of the withdrawal well. But for the most part, this part of the uh, simulation allowed us to discount the spent cat riser as contributing to the uh, afterburn. We also looked at cyclone loadings. Uh, we had information from the plant that the cyclones did not necessarily load up evenly. They didn't give us the full details until afterwards. But what we later found is that cyclones 11 and 12 here in the center of the unit um, have some obstructions that prevent the flow uh, neatly or cleanly entering the cyclone inlet horns. So that it was expected that the loading would be lower on these two cyclones. And as you can see, the simulations do show a, a noticeably lower loading on cyclones 11 and 12. In terms of the vertical temperature profile, the model shows where the afterburn is occurring and also captured its degree. It showed an afterburn of around 100 degrees. Historically, it's been floating in that 90 to 100 degree range. So the model was able to capture that afterburn. There were cooler temperatures observed in the dense bed and just above the spent cat distributor and air rings. The highest temperatures were observed right about the cyclone inlet horns and opposite the withdrawal well. And here we can see the uh, smoking gun, if you will, regarding the afterburn. You can see an oxygen-starved condition in the middle of the bed. There is either too much catalyst or not enough oxygen or both. And then you can see a classic gas bypassing condition where the air is bypassing the bed and that excess oxygen is meeting the unregenerated cat up in the freeboard. Here are some uh, vertical chemistry cut planes. And again, you can see uh, on the oxygen side, we've got an awful lot of blue, a very uh, oxygen de depleted condition in the center of the bed. And then we have our bypassing condition here at the outside. On the horizontal cut planes, you can see the location of the afterburn is not uh, centered. So it is off center opposite the withdrawal well. That turns out to be important because we were able to validate the model against temperature measurements uh, taken at the plant because they do have thermocouples in each of the cyclone inlets. So if we look at that temperature profile, what we learn is that the model not only properly captured which cyclones were hottest, but also captured which cyclones were coolest. And what that means in effect is that we located the afterburn uh, circumferentially in the, in the right position. In terms of the dense bed residence time, it is certainly likely that insufficient dense bed residence time could contribute to the afterburning. Um, it's more contributory, actually, to high levels of O2 jetting through the bed, even through the center, but especially at the outside. A denser bed, or I should say a, uh, a taller bed, a uh, deeper bed, would certainly uh, help mitigate that issue. In terms of the afterburn analysis, it was concluded that low combustion air delivery to the center of the regenerator appears to be the most significant contributing factor leading to the afterburn. There were several suggestions made for how to balance that uh, combustion air and catalyst flow. Some ideas were to put an additional air ring. Here you can see the lower air ring and upper air ring. A third air ring lower down in the center of the bed might be very helpful. And also putting less catalyst into the center of the bed. It was suggested to perhaps remove one or more of these center uh, catalyst distributor arms. 
you might think that that's a fairly radical change, but the operator has reported that these are a mechanical maintenance nightmare. So having fewer of them is not necessarily going to be a problem. Uh, if they didn't want to actually remove the arms uh, themselves, one of the easier things to do to change the spent catalyst distribution would be to simply block up some of the nozzles uh, or even all of the nozzles on some of the arms in the center of the bed. So in conclusion on this first case, the Barracuda VR model accurately predicted both the gas particle hydrodynamics and the coke combustion chemistry for the unit. The results compared very well to operational data and it properly captured and located the afterburn phenomenon. It also provided insights into decisions that have to be made about how to address this afterburn in future turnarounds of this unit. In this second case study, we're going to be looking at the reactor side of the FCC unit. This particular unit is the Catlettsburg, Kentucky refinery uh, owned by Marathon Petroleum Corporation. This unit was scheduled for a revamp to include the installation of new reactor cyclones. The objective of this work was to study the impact of proposed reactor modifications for addressing erosion that had been noted in the reactor cyclone inlet ducts. There were three configurations to be analyzed and compared. There was the baseline as built case and then two alternatives, alternative one and alternative two. The two alternatives were very similar. They each had a larger diameter outlet riser, anti-vortex baffles, cyclone inlets that had been expanded, and new cyclones. Alternative two also had sloped cyclone inlets. Here were the boundary conditions for the model. As you can see, we're modeling the top of the reactor, including the primary separator, which is uh, proprietary to UOP and is redacted here, going into the riser where the flow is then divided into the 10 reactor cyclones. We're modeling one of the cyclones in detail and then the other nine using uh, pressure boundary condition. As with all Barracuda simulations, we need to know something about the particles that we're to model. So here is the particle size distribution for the solids that are going into the, uh, into the cyclone. Here we can see the baseline particle flow results. On the far left is the residence time distribution, then the speed, and then the particle inlet. The primary separator in this case has three disengager arms. So the particle inlets were numbered 1, 2, and 3 to see how the particles mix out and divide among the 10 cyclone inlets. One of the things that you can observe from this animation is that the solids flow field has very significant transient fluctuations. If you were to assume that your 10 cyclones are carrying the same load at any given instant in time, that would be an incorrect assumption. If you were to assume that the 10 cyclones carried the same load on a time average basis, you'd also be wrong. Here's what the cyclone loading looks like from above. You can see that at different points in time, some of the cyclones are unloaded while others are loaded, and some of the cyclones do carry a heavier load than others. In the model where the cyclone is modeled in detail, you can also see the particles pulling away from the wall. From the per for the purposes of cyclone performance, we'd really like to see those particles hugging the wall. This was later to be uh, determined as a result of the direction of the swirl caused by the primary separator. So it was suggested if that direction was not uh, set by some other part of the design, that the pitch of those veins could be reversed, and then the particles, instead of entering the uh, the cyclone inlet in this direction and pulling away from the wall would be entering it in this direction and would be perhaps more inclined to hug the wall going around the cyclone. Here were the effect of the alternate designs on the bulk flow behavior. You can observe some significant differences between the two alternatives and the baseline primarily because of the presence of these straightening veins here but it's necessary to look in more detail at the 
cyclone inlets, what kind of velocity is being carried into them, and that sort of thing to determine which design is more effective. One of the things that we did was to calculate an erosion index for determining which design was most effective. Here are the erosion index calculations. Here the erosion index is calculated from some function of the angle uh, alpha. So C is a function of the angle alpha. For materials that are uh, brittle in nature, like refractory, that function is going to be such that you have maximum erosion at uh, normal impacts. If we were looking at erosion on a ductile material like steel, then we would want that function to maximize the erosion when we're at an oblique angle. But the erosion index is, the, is a, a function of that angle, alpha, the mass to some power, and the velocity to some power. Now this mass is the mass of each individual particle, so it is necessary to have a modeling methodology that models the individual particles if you're going to try to capture erosion in this way. This power on the mass means that the heavier particles have a greater impact on the erosion than the lighter particles do. If this were uh, 1.0, then you would say that all particles, light or heavy, have the same impact on erosion. In this case, we used a fairly modest 1.5. On the velocity, which really controls the erosion, the power generally runs from 3 to 4, and in this case, 3.5 was used. When we look at the erosion index, we can see that both of the alternative designs dramatically reduced the erosion in the cyclone. So we can expect that either of these designs would be very effective at reducing that erosion. Whereas alternative two looks to be slightly better than alternative one, they are both so much reduced from the baseline that they are effectively identical. Uh, so you would make your design decision when it comes to, uh, to planning your turnaround based on other factors than the erosion, because either alternative would work. You might choose the pressure drop across the cyclone, the ease of fabrication, or some other reason uh, to choose between them. In conclusion on this case, the CPFD model was used to compute the multi-phase flow in the reactor uh, outlet riser and cyclones and allowed us to calculate the erosion index values. We did notice sub significant fluctuations in the solids flow into the cyclones, but both alternative designs are expected to reduce the cyclone inlet erosion. This is an example of a case where having a model for the reactor allows you to move forward with the changes you are going to make with greater confidence and lower risk. Better decisions need to be made in a wide variety of industries where fluidized equipment is used. Oil and gas refining is certainly one of the most important segments where Barracuda virtual reactor is employed for making decisions about unit design and operations. Several FCC technology licensors use Barracuda VR. These include Technip, UOP, Shell, Total, IFP, and others. Refiners can also use the technology themselves for providing a decision support system for future FCC unit turnaround planning. We live in a demanding operational and regulatory environment and refiners face many challenges in optimizing FCCU design and performance. Among the major challenges is how to understand fully the root causes of operational issues. Best practices demand we make decisions based on facts, on a sound engineering basis. These case studies demonstrate that Barracuda virtual reactor models can provide engineers the insight that is required to diagnose and solve problems in FCC units whether these issues are related to reliability, operations, or emissions. This is a proven technology that's already in use by some of the world's leading manufacturers and FCC technology licensors. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer some questions.